Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome back to the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. My name is Zach Pakin, and I am a research fellow uh, associated with the Canada's role on the Global Stage Program at IPD, as well as the project manager of the China Strategy Project, which we are running right now. Uh, so before we begin uh, today's uh, fourth panel discussion associated with the China Strategy Project, uh, allow me just to introduce uh, IPD. For those of you who are not aware, we are a North American think tank uh, focused on international affairs uh, that privileges a realism and restraint-based uh, orientation in our analysis. Uh, and we're grateful to our panelists for being with us uh, today to help us uh, uncover uh, one uh, angle uh, of uh, this question as it relates to China's rise and the impact that it's going to have on Canada and the angle that we will be looking at today is the future of Canadian universities, the impact on Canadian universities uh, resulting from not just China's rise, but the subsequent uh, deterioration of Canada-China relations that we've seen uh, in recent years. The China Strategy Project uh, is uh, an initiative that we've been running at IPD for the past few months and that we will continue to run uh, into 2022. Uh, it consists of a number of uh, publications, but uh, centers on five uh, panel discussions, uh, which we are putting together, this being the fourth, as I've already mentioned. Uh, we've already held discussions uh, on, on uh, Canada's uh, vision of a rules-based international order and where China fits into that vision in our first panel. We then moved on to a second panel, looking at the economic dimension of the relationship uh, going forward between Canada and China. Uh, the third panel, which we just recently hosted, deals with the question of multiculturalism and not just its role in Canada, but also how it needs to potentially be rethought in the context of a multipolar world. Uh, and today, in panel number four, we're going to be looking, as I've mentioned, at the university's question. I'd just like you all uh, as well, for those of you joining us today online, uh, to go, please feel free to check out our previous uh, panels, which are all available on our YouTube page. You can just look up the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy on YouTube, and you'll find them there. And please keep your eyes peeled as well for the fifth and final panel discussion of the China Strategy Project on climate change what China's rise implies for, and China's deteriorating relationship with the West uh, imply uh, for Canada's ability to meet its climate goals on, on the world stage. That will be taking place in early 2022. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, allow me to turn it over to today's uh, moderator who has graciously joined us, Paul Evans, who is a professor uh, at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, specializing in Asian affairs and trans-Pacific relations, as well as since the beginning uh, of 2021, the HSBC Chair in Asian Research. Paul, over to you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Zach, and thank you to uh, uh, the uh, IPD for uh, hosting this series and allowing us to have a special session on the universities. Uh, universities have played a crucial, a crucial critical role in the Canada-China relationship for, for more than 40 years from small uh, government funded projects in the early 1980s to uh, uh, the creation of a set of interactions that in their scale, intensity, financial importance uh, are a vital part of the Canada-China relationship. Uh, this is no longer, uh, our universities play multiple roles uh, in connections with China related to students, related to research, uh, related to uh, dialogue, partnership activities. What was a, a government funded cottage industry in the 1980s is now a multi-dimensional set of interactions. All of our institutions uh, have deep connections with China uh, at a time that we're all aware that this is uh, not business as usual, or at least not business as we've known it uh, in, the, uh, in the last decade. Uh, we still have the connections. Uh, we still have many, many projects, professors going uh, back and forth, working together, but the ground is shifting underneath these relationships. Partly um, in an immediate challenge that is because of COVID uh, and what it's done to our face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, but there are geopolitical winds blowing as well. Uh, the U.S.-China relationship, the strategic competition has affected uh, American uh, institutions, their interactions with China, new kinds of restrictions that have come from their uh, national government uh, under Mr. Uh, Trump, but also under President Biden. Uh, a, um, 
uh, a new feeling, a new mood in the Canadian public about China, partly as triggered by our three M's thousand days, but also some deeper concerns about changes inside China, uh, changes in China's uh, interaction with its neighbors and uh, international institutions. Um, there's, there's a little bit of a, clearly a coal wind blowing uh, and how it is going to affect our universities, what we do, what we can't do, how we're going to keep the door open as far as possible in these new circumstances is I think the challenge all of our institutions recognize in every university, college across the country, every educational institution, what, how to understand uh, this current mood, how to understand which way winds are blowing, uh, where Ottawa is moving uh, in its approach uh, to, to China and to universities and research collaborations in particular. All of these forces, all of these factors are in play at once. And this gives us a chance to, uh, to drill down into the current state of play uh, on research, on other kinds of partnerships with China, featuring three very interesting individuals uh, who are with us today. Uh, the first of them is, uh, the first of our, our panelists today is uh, Paul Davidson, who is the president of Universities Canada, some a job he's held for uh, more than a decade now. Uh, he previously ran the World University Service uh, uh, serv World University Service of Canada uh, 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 program. Uh, he was the executive director of the Association of Canadian Publishers, uh, graduate of Queen's and Trent Universities, and someone who has played a, a very important role in the current discussions as our universities, which are spread across the country, uh, are navigating their ways collectively in responding to China and in working with uh, representing views to uh, government agencies in Ottawa. So Paul has been a, uh, uh, a consistent and active player in the discussions that are underway. Uh, our second panelist is um, Dr. Martha Crago, uh, Vice Principal of Research and Innovation at McGill University. Uh, she leads a working group at McGill uh, that examines foreign influence and interference in the sphere of research, uh, not exclusively about China, but with China as a, as a principal, if unstated part of that. She's been a key participant in national and international committees concerned with safeguarding of research, uh, including as chair of the governing council of the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, uh, the research committee of the U15 group of Canada's research intensive universities that has had a special interest in the China question. Uh, and also uh, she's worked with Americans uh, through the, uh, 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 well, through uh, 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 the American Council on Education and has here also worked with INSERC, our uh, National Sciences Engineering Research Council which is uh, out in front on some matters that we will be talking about later in our discussion. And our third panelist is Professor uh, uh, Wang Riji, or uh, Riji, depending if you have a Northern accent, uh, is a professor here at the University of British Columbia in materials engineering and biomedical uh, work. His research focuses on hips, uh, hip replacements, prevention of hip fractures, something that for a certain demographic in Canada is a real, real key to our future. <laughs> and uh, has, um, uh, he, he grew up in, in mainland China, uh, but for the last 30 years has lived outside of China and has studied and worked at, at several universities uh, in China, the United States, Israel, and Canada. Uh, and he's particularly important to today's discussion uh, because of his connections uh, with Chinese partners, institutions, but also because of his involvement with two associations here of professors who have been uh, concerned, uh, reacting to the new guidelines, the new insert guidelines, 
which are the kind of cutting edge of where some of the new security concerns intersect with our funding agencies and our professors at the uh, uh, ground level who have or are considering partnerships with China. So with that, how we're going to uh, proceed is uh, I'd like to open with each of you for four or five minutes to set the stage. And then in basketball terms, we'll have a toss up. Uh, after uh, uh, I speak with each of you, we'll have some questions that I hope you will interact with each other. And that those questions I hope will represent what some of the active concerns are now in the minds of, of some of our government officials, uh, but also our professors and our university leaders across the country. So uh, welcome to you all. It's wonderful to be with each of you again. Uh, and let's, let me, if we could, start with Paul Davidson. Uh, and Paul, can you set the scene for us? How important is China to Canadian universities? China is remarkably important to Canadian universities and to Canada, and it has been for the last several decades. Uh, you know, a large market, a growing market, a rapidly growing market, uh, a, a society that's making great advances in the research space and that Canadians need to know what's happening there. And, uh, and in another dimension, in terms of attracting international students to Canada, Canada has, has benefited enormously from international students on campuses right across the country. So there are many dimensions to the relationship. And I'm really pleased, Paul, that you, 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 you pointed to the initial programs in the 1980s um, that made really strong people-to-people -people connections between Canadian campuses and uh, campuses in China. And, and for some universities, the relationship goes back even further, over a hundred years. And uh, so universities have an expertise that can be brought to bear as we think through these really challenging issues. Um, well, you know, let's, what are those main challenging issues? To take it from the national perspective, each of our institutions are wrestling with specific problems. Um, but across the, across the country, what, do, what is the state of play? Uh, how high is the anxiety level around interactions with China right now? Well, just to provide a little context, I mean, Universities Canada represents 96 universities across the country from the most research intensive to small liberal arts universities. And, uh, and every university in the country has an interest in China. For some, it's a major research partner. And what the fields of research are that they're engaging in, who their research partners are in China, um, and, and how we can attract and retain uh, really top talent from around the world remains an important consideration. For virtually every university, international students has become an increasingly important part of the classroom experience and also uh, the funding of universities. Uh, and so Chinese students uh, represent a very large proportion of the international students operating, uh, studying on campuses across the country. And then we've got the, the added dimensions of recent developments in geopolitical realignments and increasing concern around uh, securing research. And that's been an ongoing conversation amongst universities for the last several years with our, with our federal interlocutors. Um, and again, to, to paint a general picture, how would you compare the issues that we're debating uh, and um, uh, organizing around in Canada as compared to the United States, Australia, the United Kingdom? The China challenge is not unique. It has special characteristics in Canada, but it is not unique to China's it, it, interactions. What's, uh, what do we look like in comparative context? Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, in some respects, Canada was ahead of some of our uh, competitor or colleague nations in thinking about these issues. Uh, the government of Canada was very early on in creating a, a government universities working group to consider these issues. It, it worked well and it worked quietly for a number of months. Australia chose to make a public announcement of their group and they've been doing some really good work. Um, I, I would say that another consideration is how the U.S. has um, shifted its positioning over recent years in a significant ways. And Canada has to be mindful of that given the Canada-U.S. relationship. Um, I think the United Kingdom has, has played a, a valuable role in looking at new tools and techniques for managing and mitigating risk. 
And then other players have also made a helpful contribution. With Universities Canada, we're working with our international counterparts. We're meeting about every six weeks to, to, to recalibrate and reflect on what the changing nature of the relationship is geopolitically around the world. And this presents some challenges to us, but also some tremendous opportunities for, uh, for doing what universities do well. And I'll just add in here that all universities take security seriously, but we also take our broader role as universities seriously. And that universities have worked in places where governments have not been able to work effectively, that the people to people linkages that are made, that the relationships that are built can, can add lasting value for Canada. And so that as we navigate a new geopolitical environment, uh, let's be mindful of the assets that universities bring to bear on these challenging issues. Well, we'll come back a little bit later to the US, uh, the, the, the dynamics inside the United States, what they mean for us as example, but also. American pressure uh, for us to move in certain directions. So let me, let's, let's come back to that a wee bit later and, and dig into uh, what these challenges and opportunities might mean. That's a slippery language, challenges and opportunities. Uh, there's real things beneath the surface too. Uh, Martha, um, you've uh, been involved in the university sector in Canada for, for a long time. You're now at McGill. In general terms, before we get into the specific research issues uh, and research security issues that you, you've focused on so heavily, um, how are McGill's connections with Chinese partners and institutions at this moment? What's, what's the state of play? Okay, well, let me just um, start maybe with data that I happen to have received about an hour ago although I asked for it some time ago, but it, it arrived in a very, uh, in a perfect moment in time. So I did ask about whether there was a decline in masters and PhD students from China uh, and with kind of sketching it out year over year, the last five years, no, there is no decline. There are in steady increases. So from the research perspective of the student involvement who are extremely important in the research we do, uh, I would say at McGill, there, there's not been a decline. Um, it's not huge increases year over year, but it's steady. So um, I think that gives us one perspective that people are still very happy to receive students from China. My own you know, past was that I did a lot of, of my own personal international collaboration. Uh, and then I was at one point a vice president of uh, international at the University of Montreal. So I had a lot of, and I, I must have traveled in that job at least 16 times to, to uh, China between it and a vice presidency at Dow over about an eight year period of time, maybe slightly less than eight years. So I, you know, I've watched this situation grow. I've been aware of, issues that have concerned me uh, from time to time as uh, I worked out university relations to Chinese universities. So this wasn't an industry question, this was a university to university. So, you know, I've seen what I think have been very healthy uh, collaborative relationships. I've seen other ones that have made me kind of furrow my brow and wonder. Uh, and then, you know, starting in about 2018, uh, the university's U15 group of Canadian universities started to begin to think more earnestly about what was happening with China. And uh, of course, the episode then of the two Michaels came almost simultaneously with that curiosity about what is happening in China. So I'd say, you know, there were all kinds of initiatives that are ongoing that are probably very healthy. And then there's a certain skepticism that has set in uh, about what are we actually dealing with here? And that's not just Huawei, that's also university to university. McGill, what is the atmosphere with your faculty members, with your students? Are there any kind of tensions around things like the national security law from Hong Kong, mainland students and uh, uh, and Hong Kong students. Well, uh, yeah, how, I, guess, how's that I, playing out? I, I haven't really heard anything about that. I'm not right in the heartland of student affairs, 
but there hasn't been anything that has percolated up to the surface. I am gonna tell you about one of our professors who is an expert in cybersecurity. And this man is, uh, const is comes from Hong Kong and he's constantly uh, being requested by a certain university in China and by a company that is where the mothership is in China. Uh, to, uh, and they give him all kinds of possibilities of money and uh, laboratories in China. And he always says no, because he isn't himself interested in going to mainland China. His family is now getting some harassment over the fact that he's not accepting these offers. So he's quite a combination of scared and irritated. Uh, and, you know, he's a very fine early career researcher. So there, there are things that percolate up to the surface like that, where we're aware of certain people being feeling like they're being harassed. There are other professors who probably feel shy in the face of the new research guidelines, but don't speak out at McGill. We'll come back to that in, in just a moment with, uh, with Reger, who's been living this issue in a very interesting way. Um, but to uh, get up to research collaborations, um, national security concerns, concerns about uh, intellectual property, uh, concerns about uh, cyber uh, interventions, cyber intrusions, et cetera, have been something that um, our security agencies in Ottawa have been emphasizing and encouraging universities to both recognize the challenge and come up with some steps to, to deal with them. Um, and uh, INSERC uh, has been the first of the national funding agencies uh, to come out with a program that we're, we're not sure if it's a pilot uh, or if it's the model that is going to be used elsewhere. Um, INSERC is one small step in a direction, but uh, how important is it and how do you see it playing out the INSERC guidelines? Well, so the answer guidelines concerned one particular program they have, not their most widely used program of funding, but a particular one where that is joint funding, where the where NSERC puts up money and an industry uh, or company puts up money. And I think it was chosen because it had industry involved. And I think there's been concern about, as you said, the IP and what is happening with that kind of industry related partnered research. So uh, how, you know, it, it, there are a set of research security guidelines were developed um, in partnership with a committee that's been called Universities Government of Canada Working Group. So the universities had input, the government had input. They selected a program that was really industry partnered to begin this. Um, it, you know, it came down in a way on campuses where despite all the warning and all the information we had given people, you know, it's another piece of compliance that people have to work with. We have to have some expertise and some information for our researchers. We try to help them a lot with how they fill out a form that mostly concentrates on mitigating measures. Do you think there's a risk and how will you mitigate that risk? Uh, and we're waiting to see how all of these different uh, forms that have gotten filled out at our university, how they fare uh, with once they get into NSERC and how NSERC, you know, finds them in terms of what it is they're looking for. And I think we're going to get increasing information from NSERC as they process uh, these research security guidelines that professors fill up. Uh, and see how do they match expectations? Where are people going astray? Where are people right on the target and so on? Uh, what's happened recently, very recently, frankly, in the last month or so is that there are now um, security plans being asked for by CFI, which is an infrastructure funder, uh, and even mentioned in terms of a new biosciences research fund. Uh, that Canada is putting together. That was not a surprise to me because CSIS came forward to the campuses. Um, and frankly, this was about other, not so heavily uh, loaded in terms of uh, China. Came forward to the campuses in um, June of 2020 and said, you are, you are being heavily hacked. 
at, particularly in your biomedical labs. And so we, you know, we had a we had a CSIS person come and give a have a big meeting with researchers from the biomedical area about what they needed to be aware of and careful of. Uh, that was not actually as oriented to China, as I said. Uh, but it does make everybody aware there are things that go on that everybody wishes weren't going on. So it wasn't surprising to me that a biosciences leading to biomanufacturing fund would start to require something like this. So in, you, you, you know uh, what is happening in American institutions, mm -hmm. uh, both the funding agencies, government departments, the restrictions which are uh, uh, much wider in scope and intensive in detail uh, than we've, we've begun uh, here in Canada with the INSERC uh, uh, mm -hmm. pilot. Um, and there, uh, but there is a concern that the INSERC pilot is going to be widened. It's just the, the tip of the iceberg that is floating in this direction. What, what, what way do you see the currents going? In a year, are we going to look more like the American system uh, than uh, than uh, 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 than we do now? I don't think entirely, and I think the American system has a kind of split going in it. So um, there's what the government asked for, and there's what the universities are beginning to push back on. So it was a very nice set of values and principles that the American Association and the American Land Grant Universities put out about international collaboration. It makes it very clear this is a very, very important part of the scientific enterprise um, and scientific scholarship. So I don't, I don't think you're gonna see a uniform reaction from universities to government. I think one of the biggest differences, and this is quite different than these guidelines that we have, is that the, university, that, um, that the US has new controlled goods laws about what can happen and what can't happen. They have um, certain companies that you cannot do research with. This is not what Canada has done. Canada has said, what are the risks you see with any company, including now? So we have to be clear, these alliance grants, it is for all companies, including Canadian ones, that you define the risks and the mitigation of them. So it's really more, are you really clear what your relationship is going into this relationship? Are you clear what uses your technologies can be put to and how will you mitigate any nefarious uses? That's quite different than saying, you can't work with this company, you can't export this good. Uh, and, but I'll tell you the long arm reaches into our universities for NIH funding, you, you have to prove that you don't have any screw or tiniest part of any machine in your university made by certain companies. Well, that's, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to, the, to that long arm uh, and uh, your really reassuring comments that you don't think will be going down the American path, at least not in the way uh, that uh, it's been in place up to this moment. Uh, Rejar, let's um, talk a little bit more specifically uh, about the INSERT guidelines. Uh, and I raised the question earlier whether it's a pilot that is going to be looked at, it's studied with lessons drawn, or whether it's a model that is already in some ways ready to be rolled out uh, in other areas. It seems to have both of those characters. Uh, characteristics. Uh, Ranger, what's been your experience as a researcher with this um, new line of uh, concern about China, uh, about all countries, it's not just China, but China, China has uh, attracted the most, the most attention on these matters. What's your take on the insert guidelines? Thank you for thank you for, for, for the invitation. Also, thank you for uh, the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy for organizing this. <coughs> uh, so, uh, as uh, uh, Maza said, this is still early stage about this answer uh, called the National Security Guideline for Research Partnership. Um, this is <coughs> a fact uh, applied to answer alliance uh, program and. To, uh, for most people in science engineering, especially engineering, this is a major funding source. 
uh, usually the answer discovery part is small and this part is major. So, uh, I, I, and also, of course, this uh, funding the Alliance program and the previous program has been playing a key role in enhancing university industry relations in Canada and so has been very effective. And actually I had a few in the past and I still have a COVID-19 project from Alliance. And uh, um, we just submitted a, a called the Answer Alliance Missions uh, <clears throat> that last week. Uh, so the question here is not about the secure part uh, and the, the question is about whether this guidelines has been uh, set up for uh, clearly so um, people could follow easily. And uh, uh, my experience on this is, has been very vague. Uh, it's not a, a traditional, typical answer style, usually uh, pre precise and very clear instruction. I went through this guideline. So let me explain to you one minute uh, it has a risk assessment form. Ask uh, a researcher to fill in the form asking 18 questions. Eight relate to research and researcher and uh, uh, oh, 10 for researcher and, uh, and the research itself and also eight for the company, the uh, collaborators. And the question is whether uh, the research itself, the products will lead to benefiting other countries, not Canada. So, so this is the one, and it sounds very good, but when you go through this and try to answer yes, no, or unsure, unclear, you have to, if you're serious, <clears throat> you have to go through, Martha, you have to go through hundreds of pages of document, hundreds of them, to understand whether the research is, uh, does have any kind of risk uh, to national security. And if you answer unsure, unclear, or no, or, or yes, or unclear, then you have to find a mitigation plan, and that will be done together with university. And uh, uh, this is very difficult to do for a researcher like me. So now, if the guideline is not clear, it's vague, and also the, assess the security form will be assessed by called uh, administrative process. So not by scientific team uh, review panel. It's, it's in parallel with the scientific review and can be declined if the risk is determined high. Now the high or low, I'm not sure. I don't have any guideline on what means high, what high means and high, what high low means. So the, the issue here is not again about the intention, but it is about the process. So that's where we, when we raise concerns, <clears throat> Uh, like Paul said, two associations of Chinese professors here in Canada uh, send letters to university uh, leaders across Canada to express concerns, most probably to uh, ask for a better, a, a, a more clarification on this. So we will have better guidelines to follow. So, so this is the, roughly the background. I could go further, Paul, if you want to continue. Uh, Richard, that's interesting because as, as I've spoken with colleagues here and across the country uh, of scientists who are involved in it, they're starting to see that some of the challenges in this are in the details. Uh, what does it mean to be a sensitive sector? Who defines them? How broadly? Uh, and we don't have clear definitions of that yet, uh, nor do the Australians, nor do the uh, Americans. But nevertheless, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's one of the criteria. Um, who are appropriate partners in the China context? Uh, by, defined by institutions, uh, defined by um, uh, individuals, uh, or connections with the Chinese Communist Party, as the Albertans have been concerned about, uh, or with the Chinese military, et cetera. That in other words, we're asking scientists to do evaluations in context where for uh, the, the criteria aren't clear. So I think that vagueness thing has been signaled going back and they're very, it's very hard to give answers to those questions. But Rija, you've also been dealing with another factor which is inadvertent consequences. And I've had many, many colleagues express the view that the consequences of playing this game, uh, of, of filling in these forms in these kinds of ways, 
may stigmatize individuals, particularly who are going to have ongoing connections with institutions in China, or at least would like to. And many of those are people of Chinese descent. So that there is a chill that is being felt by some researchers, uh, and there is a fear, or at least a suspicion, that American style, they may be under a magnifying glass in ways that um, they, they don't think are appropriate and come close to potential racial profiling. Uh, these are things I hear. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you think? This is true, thank you, Paul. Um, about back to security part, it, it's very vague. And uh, the, the real issue is we don't have a guideline what, whether this the criteria is that this security risk is high, medium. For example, <clears throat> aluminum and copper are listed as sensitive material. And if you are working on aluminum or copper, and you should answer it's yes. So that's one. And second, if you, your team have <clears throat> any possible collaboration in China and your students might come from China, even Chinese citizen, there's a possibility that the research progress will be leaked to a third party. So you should answer yes or unclear. So, so this, this is the concern. Now, the real concern you mentioned is really goes along the called US uh, China initiatives. In the past few years, about a dozen of uh, uh, called Chinese American professors, actually one of them is Canadian, has been prosecuted because, not because of spying or espionage, but because of failing to <clears throat> declare certain connections, research collaboration with China. Now, this is exactly happening here, the concern. When you fill in this form, answer those 18 questions. What happened you answered the wrong? What happened you missed a, a talk in China in your CV? Now, this file will be in the database of thesis. And in, in United States, FBI has been working on in the past few years, working on those data. And this could be the data base to start with if China or if Canada actually decide, hopefully this is not the direction, decide to have Canadian version of China initiatives. So this is a concern. We will submit a data form that has all the evidence there. So uh, will this lead to a similar issue in uh, Canada, or similar to US? That's disaster in US to some of them. Let me uh, turn to Paul and Martha on this. Uh, I, I raised the question of whether the insert guidelines are a pilot. And often pilots are designed to you put some things up, you consequences, uh, intentional, uh, but also unintentional. Uh, and can, can those of you closer to the nation's capital give us a sense of how the INSERC uh, pilot uh, is being a sure. I'll, I'll yes. jump in what here. Are, uh, what's 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 the state of play around? Uh, I'll jump in here, Paul and Martha may want to add add some comments as well. But in developing the guidelines, it was uh, facilitated in part by the university uh, government working group, and with a very tight timeline, ninety days to deliver the the guidelines. And. You know, in terms of how we were operating, we were, we were encouraging each player in this ecosystem to accept their appropriate role and responsibility. Universities will not become national security agencies uh, and universities have distinct roles to play. We're also hoping that, that the guidelines would be developed in such a way that they could be proportionate to risk. And that's a key, key theme. Like, um, we don't. We cannot boil the ocean on this. Where is the problem? How do we frame the problem? And then, thirdly, that that anything that we that that is developed can be actionable across the country. Um, simply making vague pronostications about potential security threats really isn't very helpful to researchers. It's not very helpful to university leaders. And so, these guidelines were designed to be focused on the engage program, and for a period as a pilot. And I think we're still in the very early days of learning it and, and, and 
colleagues advice here about where is their vagueness? Where is there a, a lack of clarity? What are the unintended consequences? Those are important questions that, that I think we all want to wrestle with and engage in before anything further happens. Now, in recent weeks and months, as Martha was alluding to, some other parts of the research ecosystem have been advancing other approaches, sometimes cutting and pasting the security guidelines and other times uh, developing other ones. And that also becomes potentially unworkable. And so we've got to keep our eye on this ball. I don't know if Martha has, has other observations in recent weeks and months. Well, I thought, I thought I could contribute something here. I sit on a, a working group, an expert working group that the OECD has put together as a representative of Canada with somebody from ICED. And what's been very interesting to me, it's gone on for a year now, and it will finally deliver a white paper by the end of somewhere in 2022, hopefully June. Uh, and this working group has, you know, I've watched over the course of the last year, the number of countries that are beginning to reverberate with this issue of research security and the number of countries that have started to put guidelines in place. And this has increased over the year, over the course of the last year. Um, and what people are asking for a lot is information, expert advice, shared advice, shared information, so that everybody doesn't have to invent the wheel again. Country by country, never mind institute, you know, university by university. So, and, you know, I think a lot of people feel there needs to be, as Great Britain put together, some kind of group that puts information together, and we don't have that in Canada right now, that you can take particular proposals to that people think are problematic and they can weigh in on them. Um, I, I have to make a comment about something that has to do with what I've learned when, when I sit on this group called the American Association of Universities. Uh, so these are 65 some top universities in North America. And what's happened is the Thousand Talents program in China has changed. It now only will fund ethnic Chinese people. So those people uh, who are part of that and are not reporting on the money they're getting from that program or the equipment or the labs will now a priori be ethnic Chinese. So there will be a way in which they feel like there's a special attention to them, but that's built into the program. That wasn't built in by the United States, that was built in by China. What many universities in the United States are now thinking about and putting together forms on is conflict of commitment, not just conflict of interest. So if you're taking money, $50,000, let's say, and you're not reporting this to your university, uh, and you're doing work with another university in, in China, and you're not talking about that to anybody, that is a conflict of commitment. We don't permit that with another university in the United States or Canada. So this program has led to a, a variety of things and it's led to certain people not declaring on their NIH proposals or their NSF proposals, the kind of money they're being supplied by other countries. So, you know, I do think we have to take that seriously. You, you, you have to say, you know, when you fill out your grant form, you have to be honest. When you have a relationship with your university, you have to be honest about your working relationship with them. And unfortunately, this new ruling about being ethnic Chinese means that the attention, the violations are all falling upon ethnic Chinese people, which puts them under a spotlight that's quite unfortunate. Jer, what's your reaction? Oh, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> I, I, I agree that, uh, you know, every uh, country, US, uh, Canada should protect its interests. But back to the issue, for example, of the Thousand Terran program, by the way, this is uh, like we have a similar version, if you don't, you're not aware of it. I came with a CRC chair. Mm -hmm. I would consider this Thousand Terran program. Mm -hmm. So it's it's normal. It's private to be for a country. The question will be: Is that done legally or not affect other country interests? In our case, 
uh, is the individual has conflict of interest. <clears throat> this is an issue, but this has been there. Like UBC every year, we declare conflict of interest in the form <laughs> every year. And uh, if you work outside UBC, let's say for more than uh, 60 days, the, uh, this is an issue and uh, has, has been there and there are rules to follow. So mm -hmm. I, I don't think this is new, but uh, the, the key is if we, because of those, we, if we make a national guideline, this most probably that the, the process gone very far. Uh, of course, that national security guideline is not about China, it's to protect Canadian interest. And again, this is a, this is fair. It's the right way to do. The question will be, like Martha said, it might unintentionally affect certain group of people. And Can I jump in here, Paul? Oh, sorry. I, I was just gonna jump in because I think it's it's really important how we frame this issue. And I was really pleased that uh, uh, while Bill Blair was Minister of Security, National Security in Canada, he had a very interesting observation of framing this. He said, listen, we know that Canada's universities are international. And that is in Canada's interest that we be international. And it's the role of government and the security agencies to enable universities to play their international role appropriately and safely. That's a very different framing than certain people are doing certain things. And if you knew what they were, you'd be very nervous, but we can't tell you what they are. And boy, you might want to look over there. And so I, I really want to be careful that as we move forward and as we navigate new geopolitical relationships in the world, we don't lose sight of the fact that research is a global enterprise, that Canada is at the top of the world in many fields, and that we have things to learn from other countries, and we need to find ways of doing that that are, safely, that are done safely and securely. But anything that leads to us being inwardly looking or working with only certain types of countries will keep Canada away from some of the great discoveries that are going to happen in the ensuing decades. And if we think about the pandemic, if we think about climate change, if we think about aging societies, we've got a lot to do globally. And so this is why it's so important that we get the rules of the game right, recognizing that we are not security agencies, we are not governments, we are universities, and we have got a distinct role to play in, a, in the whole Canada relationship with whether it's China or other countries in the world. I just think it's really important to frame the conversation in a way that helps us move forward rather than start finger pointing at certain kinds of academics, certain fields of study, or people of, of different kinds of backgrounds. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real preoccupation that we have. Well, I think that's a, a view that is shared by many many Americans of the sort that um, uh, Martha mentioned. But the way it is playing out in the United States uh, puts national security on a different footing. It trumps, excuse the phrase, uh, it, uh, uh, it can trump the uh, effort uh, by universities to play that mission. And our question is, are we going to be insulated from that in Canada, at least to some extent? And I'm hearing encouraging remarks from uh, all of you on that panel. Uh, as we move forward though, we to, to implement a balance between national security and that openness agenda, we're going to have to be better prepared in terms of some definitions uh, around what might be sensitive sectors, who are appropriate partners, but we're also going to need assistance around who makes decisions uh, on those, those, the due diligence that is going to be necessary to, to help professors when they're filling in those forms, you know, what, what really is a, a, a questionable connection or research area? And at this stage, who should someone pick up the phone and, uh, and call? Who do you call to give you advice on that? Australians are wrestling with this question with no easy answer yet. American friends can't do it with an easy answer. Are we going to be able to create some kind of organization that can do the due diligence that as Paul, you said, our institutions themselves can't do, we're not set up to do? What kind of agencies or what kind of institutional innovations do we need? 
Martha may want to jump on and jump in on this, but I would say I'm, I'm very attracted and interested in a, in a recent development in the United Kingdom where uh, several departments of government have banded together along with university leadership to develop a one-stop shop in the government of the UK to help universities navigate these challenging questions, not only related to China, but to other actors as well, where you can have expertise, technology, uh, deep knowledge of, of relationships and get guidance. And I, I, I emphasize guidance because uh, I think universities need to preserve uh, the capacity to work with partners they feel there's a need to, to work uh, with. Uh, uh, I, I get nervous when governments get to, too specific about who you can and cannot work with. That said, if there are legitimate reasons of national security, of course, universities would respect the advice. And, and just as we do on workers' health and safety, we don't invoke academic freedom to say, no, we're not gonna have a safe workplace. But being able to uh, work knowledgeably with partners is, is a key element of the academic enterprise. So this new uh, exercise in the United Kingdom is very, very promising and may help people like Martha and may, like, may help academic researchers uh, navigate this new world. Martha, I don't know if you've got a view on that. Uh, no, I agree with you, but I am gonna tell you people a story that has to do with Google and how you can get information from Google. So we have a student, not a young student, He's got a professor. The professor makes an alliance grant with a company. The student happens to be the CEO of this company. Uh, this company happens to be shipping materials through a front in the United States to Iran that measure uranium. Uh, NSERC picks this up by a Google search under the name of the company and sees there's a court case in the United States and contacts us and says, there's something funny going on and basically end the Alliance grant. They got it through Google. That's how much ex expertise it took. So there's a little lesson in here. There's more information out there than we may think. Uh, this isn't exactly the same as what we're talking about, but it's a very interesting case where some clever staffer at Answer just Googled the name of the company as per the Alliance grant and unraveled this whole thing that we weren't aware of at all in the university. That when we signed the agreement with this company, nobody Googled it, nobody asked who the owner of it was and what the relationship of the owner to the supervisor was who took the Alliance grant. So, and, and whether and how it was involved in a foreign state over something that is not exactly what we wish we were involved. So this is, these are stories that are real, but what really struck me is you didn't need a team of experts. You didn't need a national office of expertise. You needed to Google the name of the company. And I said to my people, from now on, when we sign with somebody, Google it first, just see what comes up. <laughs> so I do agree that we need, we need a body of expertise uh, and we need it to be sane and rational. And at the same time, we need to use whatever public information we can get. And I have gotten value out of conversations with the Canadian Embassy in Beijing uh, and with CSIS. And I think that illustrates again, Paul, that over the last several years, universities are, are, are devoting more time and attention to these matters because the world is changing. Uh, you know, until until just weeks before uh, the two Michaels were taken, there was a major Government of Canada delegation in Beijing encouraging all universities to go faster and deeper in the research relationship. That was three weeks before the, the Michaels incident started. And so, um, you know, universities uh, want to play in the world, can play effectively in the world. And, and over the last several years, we have been in developing more rigor and more, more process in figuring out who the best partners are to work with and how to move forward. I think the solution also come out, out of research. I, I think we, we need to do more research on this issue, uh, China, Canada, US relation, how this will in, uh, affect international research collaboration. I, I, I happen to read one article, it's written by uh, a faculty called Jenny Lee from University of Arizona. And uh, 
about US Canada or US China research collaboration in terms of publication, in terms of funding. And uh, also I want to, to point out there's a nature index that track all the international collaborations. So, so these, these are very important. And the conclusion is China actually is on the second uh, most collaborated uh, country in terms of publications. It's on the first of the US. And uh, the benefit of this kind of collaboration is to both sides, but to benefit Canada and US more than China. So that's interesting. It's one side of research, but I think it doesn't matter what you do. Before we make any conclusion, this research, this kind of research, it's in, in, in one of the tri councils, most probably it can be done. And uh, I, I don't know whether this has been done in Canada, but in US, for sure, it's active. The other side is uh, I, I searched National Science Foundation. Actually, even though with all this very tough, difficult time between US and Can uh, China, there is still active research collaboration between National Science Foundation in US and National Science Foundation of China, trying to call for proposals on called urban sustain sustainability. So US is doing that. Uh, is that something Canada should also be aware of? And, and this is where, as I say, you know, actionable advice is really helpful for university leadership and for academics. Um, there have been some models suggested where there be uh, red, yellow, green uh, areas for advancing the relationship. Um, and, you know, again, on, on all sorts of biomedical science right now, the world needs to be working together very quickly and well. On climate change, the world needs to be working together. Uh, and I think, as, as, as colleagues have just said, we can, uh, we can demonstrate there are ways of doing this that are of net benefit to Canada, that are of benefit to Canada, and that's important. Um, nobody here is suggesting that we should be just giving our intellectual property away or just turning a blind eye to things that we should not be turning a blind eye to, but making sure that it's, it's practical, that it's proportionate to risk, and that it's actionable is really important. This red, yellow, green uh, uh, approach is a, is a fascinating one because it suggests that there will be some areas we can't touch, some kind of partners we can't touch, and others where there's a green light where they're in fact going to be encouraged. But making those decisions around real projects in 20 or 25 percent of cases is very difficult. Uh, <clears throat> and how those guidelines, the ethos around them, evolves is, is part of the, the background to today's discussion. Because once we move beyond simple awareness and vigilance around problems and have to start making those other decisions, uh, we, um, we're going to need some help. And I'd suggest that for our, uh, our audience today, something that would be interesting for signals from Ottawa is, is not what's going on with the research uh, funding agencies, the councils, but what is going to come into the Huawei decision uh, and how far the Huawei decision is going to be restricted to the 5G issue, the equipment, as compared to the research and development and other aspects of Huawei's connections in Canada. Um, we are, none of us know exactly where this is going to land, but it is going to be a signal of how far some of the stronger American forces in this matter are going to play through as against our professors, many of whom have a special interest in working with Huawei. We have some interesting decisions coming up. Let me ask all of you as a last question uh, to um, uh, kind of on where we're going to be. Do you think in three years time that, the, that our number of research collaborations that uh, Rieger just mentioned uh, in the United States and Canada, but in Canada, that our number of research collaborations and partnership with Chinese institutions will be at the level they are today, uh, will increase or will decrease considerably. Put on your prognosticators hats, uh, you, uh, you leaders on this matter. What do you think is where, we're, where are we going to be in three years? Sure, let me start with you. You suggested a chill. What do you think?
Read you. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, I think I have seen it's already declined, the interaction and the potential collaboration. Uh, how quickly, depending on the, the uh, geopolitical situation. Fine. Uh, Martha, what do you think? What's the trend line? I actually think that it will decrease, but not for the reasons we've been talking about. I think travel in general will decrease, long distance travel, and there will be uh, new ways that people will do collaboration, but it may not be as fertile as when people went and spent time with each other and so on. So I think we have to be careful what reason a decrease or increase would happen. Mr. Davidson. Well, we just don't know right now what it will be in three years. And a lot of that depends on the kinds of decisions and conversations we've been having today. Uh, these are important matters. And I guess one of the things that universities bring to these conversations are decades of experience about this. And, and in the warp and weave of world affairs, universities are a steadying presence and, and we can play that role. I, I don't know whether it'll be more or less. I do know it'll be different than what it has been. And, and the nature and character of that research relationship is gonna be really important as to whether we solve challenges like climate change and pandemics. Well, thank you. And this uh, to all three of you for views, we are, uh, uh, our major objectives is to find ways to connect Ottawa and our decision makers uh, into the university community through um, uh, leading administrators like uh, two of you gathered here, and also through some professors who have very specific interests and some ideas about how to proceed. And I don't think we have the, the perfect institutional matches on this, the kind of thinking uh, power we're going to need to come up with uh, those solutions that Paul Davidson uh, is optimistic that we can work towards uh, on these matters. But thank you uh, to the, the three of you. Uh, this broadcast, as it goes out, uh, our taping uh, is going to attract some attention. And I hope it can be a, a catalyst for uh, some further discussions that we can broaden to, uh, to, a, to a broader community. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so with that, Mr. Pakin, back to you in headquarters. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for your excellent moderation and for being a consistent friend of the Institute as well. We're really grateful that you were able to devote your time today to thinking through this issue uh, for our audience. Um, and we're also very grateful to have you, the three of you as panelists as well. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time at IPD thinking about uh, high-minded geopolitics and the like. And so we're actually very, very fortunate when we're able to have experts like yourselves come in and to educate our audience about the wider uh, and, and multiple dimensions uh, that are you know, likely to be affected by uh, China's rise and, and its varied uh, impact on, on Canada. And so thank you very much to all of you for helping us think through this, uh, these issues today. Just a reminder again to our audience uh, that uh, the fifth and final installment of the China Strategy product Project will take place in early 2022, where we're gonna be looking at the environmental angle. So please join us then, please sign up uh, for, for our mailing list. And if you'd like to learn more about the China Strategy Project, you can go to our website, which is peacediplomacy.org, and then just click on the projects tab at the top right, and you can find the China Strategy Project right there. Thanks again for joining us today. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.